We're continuing our journey through the book of Hebrews, and today we begin chapter 7, and we're looking at the first 10 verses. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, the priest of the Most High God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And to him Abraham apportioned a tenth part of everything. He is first, by translation of his name, a king of righteousness, and then he is also king of Salem, that is, king of peace. He is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. See how great this man was to whom Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth of the spoils. And those descendants of Levi who receive the priestly office have a commandment in the law to take tithes from the people, that is, from their brothers, though these also are descended from Abraham. But this man, who does not have his descent from them, received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. It is beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. In the one case, tithes are received by mortal men, but in the other case, by one of whom it is testified that he lives. One might even say that Levi himself, who received tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, for he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. Let us pray. Lord, as we contemplate the mystery of your word today, we pray that you would fill our hearts with your truth, that you'd open our eyes and our hearts to you, and that you would teach us from your word. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Who is Melchizedek? This is a question which has intrigued biblical scholars for centuries. He's been mentioned briefly three times so far in the book of Hebrews, in chapters 5 and 6. And now, as we reach chapter 7, the author goes into greater detail on this mysterious character. John MacArthur, in his opening statement on Hebrews 7, gives a very good and brief summary of what we can expect to learn from this important chapter. He writes, using the two Old Testament references to Melchizedek, Genesis 14, 18 to 20, and Psalm 110, verse 4, chapter 7 explains the superiority of Christ's priesthood, priesthood that, that of this unique high priest who was a type of Christ in certain respects. Chapter 7 is the focal point of the epistle to the Hebrews because of its detailed comparison of the priesthood of Christ and the Levitical priesthood. Just look at that last sentence again. Chapter 7 is the focal point of the epistle to the Hebrews because of its detailed comparison of the priesthood of Christ and the Levitical high priesthood. And I believe MacArthur makes a good point here. The main point of Hebrews 7 is not to spark endless debates as to the identity of, Mel of Melchizedek. Rather, the focus is on the superiority of Jesus Christ over the Old Testament priesthood, including Melchizedek. Psalm 110 verse 4 says, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The central point of Hebrews 7 is that the solemn promise made in Psalm 110 verse 4 is fulfilled only in Jesus Christ. Jesus' eternal priesthood is explained in terms of these two Old Testament texts which mention Melchizedek. And the book of Hebrews describes the high priestly office of Jesus by comparing him to a real historical figure, albeit one of, of, of one of the most mysterious and obscure figures in the Old Testament. Hebrews 6 verse 20 says that Christ has become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now this comparison has been made three times already in the book of Hebrews twice in chapter 5 and once in chapter 6. But in order to try and understand this, we need to go all the way back to Genesis 14, where we first meet Melchizedek, as this encounter sets the scene for this teaching that we have in Hebrews 7. The events of Genesis 14 took place after Abraham's nephew Lot moved to Sodom, and the kings of the east formed an alliance and attacked the kings of the west around the area of the Dead Sea. The kings of the east won this war, and they carried off the people as slaves and the wealth of the cities as the spoils of war. And among those who were captured were Lot and his family and the king of Sodom. Word then reached Abraham that his nephew Lot was being taken away into captivity. So he arranged a surprise raid party on the kings of the east, 
and he defeated them. He rescued Lot and the king of Sodom and the rest of the people and all of the riches that the kings had plundered. And we read from verse 17 of, of, of uh, Genesis 14. After his return from the, from the defeat of Kedala Omar and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shaveh, that is the king's valley. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. The, what he gave him a tenth of was the spoils of war, but we'll come back to that. On his return from battle, Melchizedek met Abraham, blessed him, and in return, Abraham gave him a, a, a tenth, a, a tithe of the spoils of war. Now the question which has puzzled interpreters down through the centuries is, just who was this Melchizedek, who appears from nowhere, and apart from being mentioned in Psalm 110, and again in the book of Hebrews, is never heard from again? As I mentioned, this is not the most important question we need to consider in Hebrews 7, but we do need to address it. Because it will help us to see why this Old Testament character we meet so briefly is important in the book of Hebrews. Now, as to Melchizedek's identity, there have been many different suggestions. Some have said that he was Shem, the son of Noah, and Abraham's ancestor. Others that he was an angelic or otherwise celestial being. But the problem with both of these views is there is nothing in the text to support this. Others propose that Melchizedek is the pre-incarnate Christ, a Christophany. But there's also a problem with this popular view in Hebrews 7. If this great figure was Jesus Christ himself in pre-incarnate form, Hebrews 7 verse 3 argues against this by describing Melchizedek as one who resembles the Son of God. If you compare that to chapter 1 verse 3, where the author wrote of Jesus, he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Jesus does not resemble God. He is the exact imprint of God, and that's an attribute which is not given to Melchizedek. Also, if Melchizedek was the pre-incarnate Christ, it makes no sense to describe Jesus' priesthood as in the order of Melchizedek. So most commentators agree that Melchizedek is presented as a type of Christ. A type is, is some other person who symbolizes and anticipates the one who is to come. And we have a few examples in the Bible of that, and just three of them. Three examples of other types of Christ in the Old Testament are Joseph um, and Moses and also David. Firstly, Joseph. He is a type because of his life of suffering and, and ultimate exaltation. Joseph suffered. He was rejected. But he became a savior of his brothers, the very people who rejected him. Moses is seen as a type of Christ in his role as a deliverer. Just as Moses led the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt, Jesus leaves his leader, followers out of bondage to sin. Moses is also a mediator between God and his people which foreshadowed Jesus' role as the ultimate mediator. And then David, the shepherd king of Israel, who was a type of Christ, the good shepherd and the king of kings. So we know very little about Melchizedek. He was certainly an extraordinary man, but a man nonetheless, and one of whom God intentionally tells us only what he wants us to know. John Calvin said of Melchizedek, Amid the corruptions of the world, he alone in that land was an upright and sincere cultivator and guardian of religion. One of the first things we can learn from Melchizedek is that it is possible to follow and honor the Lord in a godless world. And the writer of Hebrews highlights four important features about Melchizedek in the first three verses of Hebrews 7. And these will help us to understand his unique place in, in the biblical narrative. The first is that Melchizedek was both king and priest. In Old Testament Israel, the kingly and priestly offices were kept strictly separate. William MacDonald wrote, in the first three verses of Hebrews 7, 
we are reminded that he combined the offices of king and priest in his person. He was king of Salem, later called Jerusalem, and the priest of the Most High, of the Most High God. He was the political and spiritual leader of his people. That is, of course, God's ideal, that there should be no separation between the secular and the sacred. However, when sinful man is reigning, it is necessary to separate church and state. Only when Christ reigns in righteousness will it be possible to unite the two. Because of the separation between the roles of king and priest in ancient Israel, no one man could dominate society. Yet Melchizedek not only combined these vital offices, but he was clearly worthy to fulfill those roles. Secondly, Melchizedek met Abraham when he returned from his victory, and he blessed him. And as we saw last week, many years before, God promised blessings to Abraham. And in Genesis 14, Melchizedek very publicly blessed Abraham after his tremendous victory over these kings of the east. And it's easy to overlook this point, but Abraham became an instant hero in the eyes of the people when he hunted down the kings of the east and defeated them and brought back the people who had been carried off as slaves. Everybody knew who Abraham was by now. And it was at this precise moment that God chose to endorse him through the appearance of Melchizedek. Martin Luther explained it very well. Melchizedek presents Abraham to the entire world and declares that only with him, in his house and family, are the church, the kingdom of heaven, salvation, forgiveness of sins, and the divine blessing. Thirdly, the writer of Hebrews in chapter 7 verse 2 examined and considered Melchizedek's name and his title. He is first by translation of his name, King of Righteousness, and he's also King of Salem, that is King of Peace. The name Melchizedek consists of the Hebrew word Melech, which means king, combined with Tzedek, which means righteous. And this name speaks volumes about this man in, in a time when people's names meant something. In the middle of the extreme depravity of the land of Canaan, particularly the infamous cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, with their idolatry and their immorality, Melchizedek exercised his kingly rule of righteousness. He stood out as upright and holy, in contrast to all the unrighteous kings around him. Salem comes from the Hebrew word shalom, which means divine or complete peace. So in Melchizedek, living in a godless region, we have a king of righteousness who ruled the city of peace. And the fourth point is that the writer of Hebrews stresses the lack of Melchizedek's genealogy, which is a strong feature of most of the Old Testament characters. Verse 3, he is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. And it's, it's this statement in particular which causes some students to assume that this means that Melchizedek was some kind of celestial being or, or even the pre-incarnate Christ. Nearly everybody else in the Old Testament, the book of Genesis in particular, is introduced with a lineage of ancestors going back many generations, but not Melchizedek. Werner McGee puts it so well in his commentary. He says, here Melchizedek is a picture of Christ and a type of Christ in another way. The Lord Jesus comes out of eternity and he moves into eternity. He has no beginning and no end. He is the beginning. He is the end. You can't go beyond him in the past and you can't get ahead of him in the future. He encompasses all of time and all of eternity. Now how can you find a man who pictures that? Melchizedek is in the book of Genesis, a book that gives pedigrees. It tells us that, Ab that Adam begat so-and-so, and so-and-so -and -so begat so-and-so. Abraham begat Isaac, Isaac begat Jacob and Esau. And you follow the genealogies on down. It is a book of families. Yet in this book that gives the genealogies, Melchizedek just walks, out, well, just walks onto the pages of Scripture, out of nowhere, and then he walks off the pages of Scripture, and we do not see him anymore. Why did God leave out the genealogy of Melchizedek? because Melchizedek was to be a type of the Lord Jesus in his priesthood. From the prophecy given in Psalm 110, we see that Melchizedek is a picture of Christ 
in that the Lord Jesus is the eternal God. And he is a priest because he is the Son of God and he is a priest continually. That is, he just keeps on being a priest. There will be no change in his priesthood because he is eternal. Melchizedek appears without any introduction and he leaves with no conclusion. And the puzzle concerning Melchizedek deepens when we read that he had neither father nor mother, neither genealogy, birth nor death. That context is important. The subject being addressed here is priesthood as a forerunner of the perfect and eternal great high priest, Jesus himself. So it would be a mistake to come to the conclusion that Melchizedek had no parents, that he was never born and that he never died. He was not the son of God, but he was like the son of God, so that his priesthood continued without interruption, just as Jesus' priesthood continues without end. So those are the four points that the writer to the Hebrews introduced, uses to introduce Melchizedek. But what we need to do is consider these, these, these four points and how the writer uses them as he points to Jesus. As we see how wonderfully they, they depict Christ as our high priest over the church. So those same four points again. Firstly, Melchizedek was both king and priest. Since earthly kings were righteous only in part, and sometimes not at all, they were not entrusted with the priestly office. But Jesus Christ, who like Melchizedek is a king of righteousness and peace, is perfectly qualified to fulfill both roles. Exalted in heaven, he is both king and priest for us. Therefore, he is the one mediator of our salvation. Having offered the sacrifice of his blood shed on the cross, for the atonement of our sins, and in his role as our mediator with God, Jesus has the power and the authority to rule over our hearts and to protect us against every enemy. As Hebrews 7.25 tells us, He is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Secondly, in Melchizedek's going out to bless Abraham, in the presence of the Canaanites, we see a wonderful type of Christ's ministry to us. When our battle is over, the risen Lord Jesus Christ will bless us before the eyes of the world. And I don't think it's a mere coincidence that today in our church we are celebrating Holy Communion. And I promise I didn't plan this sermon series by manipulating the timing to make sure we got to chapter 7 on the first Sunday of the month. One of the many privileges we have when we share in communion is that we are reminded that we are blessed by Jesus himself as he reigns in heaven. Like Abraham, we are despised by the world. Our blessing is not seen by the world, but Jesus reminds us that because we are his, we are blessed. And apart from when Noah became drunk on wine in Genesis 9, which is hardly a blessing, in Genesis 14, we have the very first instance in the Bible where bread and wine are mentioned together. And most biblical commentators agree that Melchizedek's bread and wine spoke of the body and the blood of Christ, sacrificed on the cross for us as the source of the spiritual blessing to all who believe. Melchizedek brought physical and spiritual nourishment to Abraham. And this is what God does for us in the church through the Holy Spirit, in particular when we come to the table, a place where we are reminded of what God has done for us. Paul wrote in Galatians 3, 13 and 14, Christ redeemed us so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised Spirit through faith. Thirdly, the names of Melchizedek, his, names and his name and his titles mean King of Righteousness and King of Peace. Now, of course, these apply to Jesus, but it's important yet to note the order in which they come. It is only as Jesus achieved righteousness by his life, which is imputed to or transferred to us by his death on the cross, that peace with God is available to sinners. He offers peace because he first achieved the righteousness that we lack and need. Charles Spurgeon said, note well the order of these two and the dependence of the one upon the other. For there could be no true peace that was not grounded upon righteousness, and out of righteousness 
peace is sure to spring up. It is because Jesus came to set up a reign of righteousness that he was such a disappointment to those who wanted military and political power. The people in his day, just as we do, completely underestimate our real problem, sin and its eternal consequences. One of the greatest sadnesses we see in the church today is, is those who proclaim what has become known as the social gospel or liberation theology. Yes, we are to be involved in uplifting the poor and oppressed. Jesus taught us that. But the primary reason he came into this world was to die to deal with our sin problem. Our great need is not political or social. It is spiritual. That's why the crowds wanted Barabbas freed and Jesus crucified. Because he came to establish righteousness first and then peace, Jesus ascended not to an earthly throne, not onto a war horse, but he ascended the cross. And then reflecting on the fourth point again, Melchizedek shows us that when Jesus was raised from the dead and ascended on high, he took up an eternal priesthood, becoming our priest for our salvation forever, reminding us that our sin debt has been eternally paid for. Jesus' priesthood is eternal and never-ending, as it secures eternal life, which is given to us through the gift of faith. And that's how the author of Hebrews introduces Melchizedek in the opening three verses of Hebrews 7. And he spends the rest of the chapter declaring Jesus' supremacy over Aaron and the Levites under the Old Covenant. And in verses 4 through 10, he continues the teaching of Melchizedek to make this point. And he outlines three arguments related to Melchizedek to show the supremacy of Jesus' priesthood. The first, we get back to the tithe here, that Abraham paid a tithe to Melchizedek. Verse 4. See how great this man was to whom Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth of the spoils. And to understand the meaning of this, we need to look at verses 9 and 10. One might even say that Levi himself, who received tithes, paid tithes through Abraham. For he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. The, the tribe of Levi was set apart by God to serve in religious duties. And all priests came from this tribe. Only the direct descendants of, of Aaron were allowed to serve as priests. Even though Levi, who was the patriarch of the tribe, was an ancestor of Aaron, but he did not himself hold the priestly office, he was still revered as the patriarch or the father of all the high priests who followed after Aaron. And the, the point of verses 4, 9, and 10 is that if the Levites, through Abraham, paid a tithe to Melchizedek, that means Melchizedek was superior even to Aaron. But Jesus is superior to Melchizedek. Second, Melchizedek's priesthood must be greater because he blessed Abraham. Verse 7 says, it is beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. So this means the priesthood represented by Melchizedek must be greater than the one who came from Levi through Abraham. So again, it's the superiority of Melchizedek of the priestly tribe and Jesus superior to that. And then thirdly, as no lineage or genealogy of Melchizedek is recorded in the Bible, the purpose being an illustration of eternal life, Melchizedek represented a better priesthood than the mortal Levites. Verse 8 says, In the one case, tithes are received by mortal men, but in the other case, Melchizedek, by one of whom it is testified that he lives. To be a priest in Israel, the correct lineage was important. And as we've seen, only the priests could fulfill priestly duties. And the line was important because as mere mortals, each priest died. They were not able to provide or secure salvation. And neither could Melchizedek. Although the Bible does not record his death, he did die because he was a sinful human being. He was a type which foreshadowed a greater priesthood, that of the living priest, Jesus Christ, who, according to verse 16, has become a priest not on the basis of a legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. And you'll remember that one of the great concerns of this letter is that these Hebrew Christians who were under, under persecution should not renounce Christianity in favor of a return to Judaism. Just as Jesus is superior to Melchizedek, 
so he is superior to Judaism. In fact, the law of Moses, with its priesthood, stands upon a greater foundation than Judaism. It stands on the gospel of Christ, represented by Melchizedek, who blessed Abraham. So to renounce Jesus Christ is to renounce all of the old covenant represented. And the message to the original readers of this, of this letter was that if they renounced their faith in Jesus and returned to Judaism, they would have nothing. Because Jesus is not only the God of the new covenant, but the old too. This helps us to see this relationship between the old covenant in Moses and the new covenant in Christ. Through Melchizedek, salvation in Jesus was made known before the coming of the law and the old covenant. What this means is that the new covenant in Christ is not an innovation or a modification. It is not God's plan B because plan A failed. The new covenant is called new, not because it is different, but because it brought a fulfillment to all that had been represented and anticipated for so long. We looked at John 8, 56 last week. It was in Christ that Abraham saw his hope. And Jesus said to the Pharisees, Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. Now connect that to what we read in Genesis chapter 14. It is highly likely that as Jesus said these words, he was thinking of Melchizedek in particular, as he gave Abraham this bread and wine, and how glad Abraham was to see this one who represented the source of all these spiritual blessings. He offered Abraham bread and wine, which was a picture of the saving work of Christ, which would be provided on the cross, and which is remembered every time that we come to the table. So it was essential that the Hebrew Christians who received this letter not turn back from Christ to Moses, from the gospel to the law, because both Moses and the law themselves look to Jesus Christ. And this is why we should not give up on Christ, but hold on to him alone, because he is our only hope. We are to honor him, turn to him, and trust him for our salvation. In the brief story we have of Melchizedek, we see the truth of who Jesus is. What Melchizedek pictures is the true Messiah. Who else but Jesus Christ fulfills what Melchizedek prefigures? Who else fills in the beautiful portrait which is first sketched by this mysterious man? Who else can be both priest and king, ruling in our hearts, while he upholds all of creation by the power of his word? Who but Jesus Christ combines such mighty power with meekness and grace? Who else lives forever by the power of his divine and eternal life? It is in Christ where we find perfect righteousness and perfect peace. In the story of Melchizedek, we see a picture of how Jesus ministers to us. He is the one who offers the blessings of God, the one who gives the spiritual nourishment that we need, as Melchizedek did in the case of, of Abraham. True blessing, both now and into eternity, comes only through acknowledging Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. He said in John 6, 35, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. We all want a bit of peace and quiet at times, but we have a far greater need than worldly relaxation and time out from our hectic lives. We must come to Jesus Christ because apart from His righteousness, there is no peace. Peace with God comes only from God, through the righteousness of Jesus Christ so graciously given to us. Without righteousness, there is no peace, not in our homes, our families, our workplaces, and certainly not in our hearts and our souls. Where sin reigns, there never is and there never can be peace. And this is why we need a Savior provided for us by God himself. Jesus is our King of Righteousness, cleansing us from our sin by his blood as he clothes us in the royal robes of his perfect righteousness. And as he said in John 14, 27, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. He is our righteousness, he gives us peace for all of eternity, he reigns as the righteous king over his eternal city of peace. And we close with Revelation 21, verses 3 and 4. 
Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that you, in Christ, are our righteousness and our peace. We thank you, Lord, for this mysterious character we meet in the Bible who points us to Christ, as do all of the prophets and as do all of the priests. Lord, thank you that you've provided for our great need. We confess that far too often we are consumed by our own troubles and our own challenges. But the greatest challenge that we have is what sin has done to us, and we can do nothing about that. It is only Christ himself who can redeem us and save us. And so we bless you, Lord, for your word. And we bless you for your provision to us. In Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>